Hello everyone, this is Eric, the Asian movie enthusiast, and this is my review of Battle Royal, a Japanese thriller from 2000. Now if you remember, I excluded this movie from my Asian horror year in review playlist when I covered 2000. I think I threw it in as an honorable mention, and that's because I do consider this film to be a thriller with some action and horror elements mixed in. But I rewatched it the other day, and I said, well, I may as well put out more of a full-length review of it here. So that's what I'm doing. So the plot of Battle Royal, if you're unfamiliar with it, goes something like this. 42 students, 3 days, 1 deserted island. Welcome to Battle Royal. A group of ninth grade students from a Japanese high school have been forced by legislation to compete in a battle royal on a deserted island. Now these students are each given a bag with a randomly selected weapon and a few rations of food and water and they're sent off to kill each other in a no holds barred game to the death. Now the students have 72 hours to kill each other until one person survives. If anybody other than one person, in other words if two or more people survive after that 72 hour period, the rest of them die. By, an, by explosive collars that are strapped to their necks. So some of these kids decide to play this vicious, vicious game. A few decide to, I guess, bail out early, and you'll see that in the movie very early on, but a few kids do decide to, to play this game and try to play it well in order to survive. There's a psychotic uh, transfer student, actually, named Kiriyama, and also there's Mitsuko, who's quite, uh, mm, I would say resourceful in her skills at survival. Uh, and then you have the heroes of the movie, uh, Shuya and Noriko, who are just trying to find a way off of this island and out of this game without killing anybody. You know, they're trying to avoid the violence. However, as the numbers start to dwindle down to a lower and lower number, is there any way for any of the students to survive? And that's a question that's posed. Now, there are some thoughtful dilemmas that are introduced into this movie. You know, the basic reasoning behind the government's establishment of this battle royal law, I think they reference it as the BR Act, is to address the rise in juvenile delinquency and teenagers' complete disregard for authority and education, which I think was a consequence of the fall of the economy that came before the events of the movie starting. Uh, but when you really think about it, you know, this reactionary governmental policy may not be the most logical choice because <laughs> it could very well breed even more animosity towards the government. But on the other hand, you know, maybe it would strike enough fear into the minds of the youth to kind of put them back in line. But given how the story plays out, my guess is that this director was criticizing reactionary politics. Then we have, like, the ethical handling of trust and, and uh, friendship that's introduced, which sets up an entirely different dilemma altogether. You know, do you trust your friends in this game of death, or do you murder them before they can murder you? You know, if you read uh, the review of this movie on the Midnight Eye website, it actually says that this director, Kinji Fukasaku, worked at a factory uh, during his teenage years which was during World War II, and that factory was one of the targets, one of the many targets, of the Allied bombing raids. So I think he mentioned at some point that he wanted to take those experiences of how friendship develops or breaks during threatening situations and kind of update it into the uh, contemporary era. Then there's the basic strategy of it all, of just the games themselves, which could actually be the most interesting aspect of the entire film, at least to me personally. This is because there are very specific rules that are introduced early on in a blackly humorous scene that is quite hilarious. And this creates like this highly entertaining game of death that leaves some room for strategy on the part of the players. It's not entirely based on luck, you know what I mean? So you just put yourself in a scenario and you ask yourself, you know, what would I do? And your strategy can change completely based on what weapon you're randomly given, because there's a big difference between getting a shotgun or a trash can lid as your weapon. And they, they do uh, screw a few people over on their weapons in this movie. But either way, you know, for me personally, this is what I would do. Okay, I'm fairly certain this would, this would be my strategy. I would hide out and only move around when necessary for the first, like, two days. And then let everyone kill each other off. 
And then if I were lucky enough, like the class of 42 students would dwindle down to maybe like half a dozen. And then during the final day, I could figure out a way to either take them out, you know, or become the winner somehow. You just kind of figure it out the final day. Now, if I had a few very close friends in this class, that would complicate things, right? And I'm not sure exactly what I would do. You know, I guess we could form some kind of a temporary tr truce for the first two days, just trying to defend each other. And, uh, but if you play by the rules of this game and you want to survive, you're eventually going to have to fight one another uh, to be the last one surviving at the end. So it creates a scenario that's really interesting to think about when uh, you're placed in the situation. One thing, one kind of odd thought that I always had regarding this movie is that it would be a lot of fun to get, have like a battle royal party, you know, at somebody's house, you know, with a bunch of people who had not seen this film. And I would take a little bag and I'd fill it with cards, you know what I mean, with each of the characters' name on each card. And everyone, as they came in the door, would blindly pick out a name and they would represent their character that they have to root for. And then, you know, as they're watching the movie, if their character ends up being one of the final few alive in the movie, you could get some type of party prize, like a, you know, a bottle of sake or perhaps some fresh mochi. You know, I thought that would be really interesting. And on the other hand, if your character is one of the first to die, then you'll be forced to eat a spoonful of overly spicy American green horseradish. Because we don't really have wasabi in the United States. It's overly spiced American green colored horseradish. Or, even worse... Maybe you'll receive a copy of Battle Royal 2. So it's, I thought that the whole scenario would be a lot of fun. But uh, I haven't had the opportunity to invite like 40 people to my house yet. But, you know, when I first watched this movie, I was expecting something disturbing based on the premise and some of the reviews that were out there. But it really is an exceptional piece of entertainment. There are a lot of suspenseful and entertaining sequences to enjoy. You know, my personal favorite being the lighthouse scene, I think. I like the ending a little bit, too. In addition, you know, the cinematography is very well done. The pace of the film is relentless from start to finish. If you're unfamiliar with Kinji Fukasaku's other films that he directed, I do recommend that you check some of them out. You know, personally, I'm not a huge fan of the Yakuza Papers film series, which is highly acclaimed. Uh, I did enjoy a few of them, but for the most part, I was left underwhelmed. But you probably should watch those films. They're like gangster films from, I think, the 1970s that are pretty uh, highly regarded. On the other hand, I would definitely recommend Fukusaku's Crest of Betrayal from 1994, Under the Flag of the Rising Sun from 1972, Virus from 1980, but make sure you get the uncut version, Graveyard of Honor from 1975, Double Cross from 1992, and House of Fire from 1986. That's a collection of my favorites. But this guy made a lot of movies, and most of them are worth watching. But the last thing I want to cover regarding Battle Royale is the cast, which is loaded. I'm not going to summarize the careers of all of these people, because this review will go on for hours. But we do have Tatsuya Fujiwara, Aki Maeda, Ando Masunobu, Koshi Bizaki, Takeshi Kitano, and Chiaki Kuriyama in the same film. So if you're a fan of any or all of these characters, even going back and rewatching this film, it's a, it's a treat seeing them all in the same movie. And with all of that said, are there any flaws at all to this movie? And I would say yes, I do think so. So I've covered my final positives, so now I'm going to start covering a few of the things that I think could have worked a little better. You know, I don't really understand, and I still don't understand, it's very short segment at the beginning of the film, but the students seem to not know what this BR act is at the beginning of the film. Uh, especially, it doesn't make sense to me, because at the very beginning of the film, the first scene is a winner of one of these tournaments, so to speak, and there's massive media coverage of it. So it, it, it just doesn't really make sense to me how most of these kids didn't know this thing existed before their class was selected to compete. But it's, it's a little minor gripe, you know what I mean? Also, the characters do make some boneheaded moves at times, which is typical for any type of thriller, but I think the filmmakers could have cleaned that up a little bit. Also, I would say that a few of the, a few of the more dramatic scenes are a bit overdramatic in terms of their execution, uh, especially a few of the performances during the death scenes in particular. You know, it does get a bit soap opera-ish at times, I would say. But some of those melodramatic scenes actually do work. You know, I liked 
both of the scenes involving the uh, the basketball game, where they show the flash flashback to the basketball game. I I liked both of those flashbacks, and did it did have a nice dramatic effect for me. Occasionally, though, and I I might get a little off topic here, but I do hear this criticism of overacting sometimes launched at the entire Japanese film industry at times, on message boards and whatnot. Some people th seem to think that like all Japanese actors always overact, which is a criticism that I don't really understand. <laughs> I mean, Japan makes so many movies that you could probably come up with a bunch of examples of some overacting, but there are tons of examples to the contrary, too. I mean, I could, I could really pile it on uh, if I cited, like, every Yasujiro Ozu film or Mikio Naru's film, but, you know, even if we just stick to the contemporary output for a second and look at some of my favorite well-known Japanese actors, I mean, you got Koji Akusho, who, you know, almost never overacts. He's, he almost always gives a solid performance. You know, Tadanobu Asano is basically, like, the quintessential under-actor, if anything else, right? We have, uh, Hiroshi Abe, who's probably my favorite Japanese actor of all time, he does a lot of comedy, and his comedy is very dry and, uh, and uh, witty type stuff. He doesn't, occasionally he'll get wacky, but his humor is very dry, you know what I mean? He doesn't overact a lot of the time. Uh, take another example, Shun Oguri, who uh, starred in the recent Rurouni Kenshin trilogy, he was very solid in that, very underplayed role. And then you have some of the younger actors like Satoshi Sumabuki, Junichi Okada, and Eita, who are, uh, you know, more good examples of some of the younger actors who are, you know, pretty solid in their acting ability and rarely, like, overdo it. So, you know, I could obviously go on for hours with more examples, but I think, you know, this criticism that I occasionally see is really just not hold up well at all. <laughs> but in any case, if you have not seen Battle Royal, you really need to check this movie out. You know, it's probably the most popular Japanese film of the last 20 years, or one of the most popular. And as I said earlier, it really is an exceptional piece of entertainment. The rewatch value of this movie is limitless. I've watched this movie dozens of times, and I will continue to do so in the future. And fortunately, it is widely available on DVD in the United States. I do recommend the extended version, or the director's cut, so to speak, which has some added scenes from the original version and some additional uh, gore effects that were added. That version has a runtime of approximately 121 minutes, if you were wondering. So, check this one out. And as always, I will see you next time.